Okay, so the plan, the aim of the module is to start developing your web skills. And I'll explain what those skills are. You're going to be working to web standards, so there's no proprietary technology at all. Everything is open standard, open source in this module. And you're going to be developing some open source websites using open standards and open source uh, tools. Okay, there are five sets of skills you've got to learn in this module. The first one is designing effective websites. So graphic design, we'll use some Photoshop in this one. I'll we'll be doing some demos in lectures showing you how it all works. Uh, so you're going to design some websites, thinking about usability, thinking about aesthetics, thinking about colour. And then you're going to develop the websites using HTML5 and CSS3, which are the latest web standards. Um, we're then going to do some server-side scripting, where you're going to be um, creating a database. You're going to be putting some data in it and pulling the data out to display it on the web page. You're going to be building some dynamic websites using database-driven uh, resources. We're then going to spend some time on web clients. We're going to use JavaScript and some JavaScript libraries to get some interactivity going on. Okay? Ranging from simple animations through to more complicated things like uh, Ajax, you know, where the page refreshes itself without you having to do anything. And finally, we're going to look at content management systems and look at how we use existing content management systems to build effective websites. There's five sections and there's five assignments. You've got one assignment per month. So the end of this month, the first assignment is due in. Okay, so the four week blocks. Now, yes, all coursework, 100% coursework. It's very difficult to, t to examine the subject. Um, and if you've, your maths is correct, how many weeks does that work out at? <laughs> Five months, 20 weeks. 20 weeks. How long's the term? How long's the, uh, the year? How many weeks have you got? It's April. You've got 22 or 24, haven't you? We're finishing early. Because when I ran this last year, people got so stressed towards the end, they try and get coursework finished off and get it in, they just, everything just went to pieces. So we're finishing early, and for the final four weeks, I'm going to introduce some stuff from 305 to get you ready for 305, and I've got some guest speakers coming in from, from the industry. So we're going to finish the assignment work, sort of end of Feb, isn't it? End of February time. We'll just get it over with. Yeah, then we can enjoy and relax a bit. <coughs> so 305, so if you're doing 205 at the moment, you may be in line to do the module 305 CDE. Um, and 305 CDE, we build servers, we build web APIs like sort of Facebook and Twitter, those sort of things, and we build our own systems, machine readable web. We build mobile web apps using jQuery mobile and uh, lots of JavaScript. And we work with Amazon S3, EC2. S3 is um, simple storage. EC2 is elastic cloud compute. And DB is the object database. So we take what we've learned in 205 and we apply it to more complicated things and more sophisticated things. And these are the sort of skills, if you're going to get a job in industry, working in web, this is what people are looking for. So this is where we're trying to end up. Right, 100% coursework, five assignments, Equally weighted, four weeks on each assignment. So short, sharp assignments. Each one's worth 20%. So we're going to keep things nice and tight, to the tight this year. Um, the, you're given a lab sheet to work on in your labs. The lab sheet is the assignment. So each week, you're going to do 25% of one of your assignments. Okay? So if you turn up for that two-hour lab, effectively you've got two hours of time to work on the assignment with help and support. Right? That's how it works this year. Okay, so we get back to the internet. What is the internet? What's it, uh, where's it come from? What's it all about? What well, it starts is basically it's just lots of computers talking to each other. That's all the internet is. The internet is different from the World Wide Web. The internet is the network of computers all talking to each other. And the reason it works is because they all talk the same language. They have the same protocols. They communicate in the same way. So you've got a whole series of computers, millions of computers, which can all talk to each other using open standards. And the project started off in the 60s. ARPANET was an American government project, which was about nuclear survival, about how do you get the, how do you, how do you maintain communications after a nuclear attack? 
So the idea is the architecture they designed is resilient. So if one node fails, the data will go a different route. So I think, I think last year they had a, one of the big undersea pipes, uh, uh, undersea connections failed. I think it was across by the Mediterranean. So everything slowed down, but it didn't stop. Everything got rerouted via America and came sort of across the Atlantic that way. So the idea is it's a very resilient system. <coughs> when it's, after ARPANET had been developed, it got adopted by universities to share research, to share information between the institutions. And when we talk about the internet and the World Wide Web, you've got to be clear what the difference is. The internet is the hardware and the protocols. The World Wide Web is just a service, a subnetwork which sits on top of the internet. So there's other ones here. The World Wide Web is the one we know about. File Transfer Protocol, we come across that, FTP. If you haven't already, you will see soon. Instant Messaging, that sits on top of the internet. Email, see that's not the World Wide Web, that's, that's, the, that's, that's part of the internet, but it's not part of the World Wide Web. So it's important that we sort of understand the terminology that we're dealing with. Okay, a little demo, I'm not sure the... Um, I might leave that for you to watch on your own. It just explains how data gets transferred. The, the way it works is you've got a series of nodes in the, ne in the network, and each server, each switch is a node, and when the data is sent from one place to another, it's broken into small packets, 64K packets, and each packet has data in it that tells it where it's got to end up. And the idea is it's broken into packets, and different packets can, can take different routes around the internet to get to the same destination then they all get reassembled at the end into the document. So if a packet gets lost, the server sends the, uh, your computer sends another request back and say, says, please send that packet again. And the packets arrive, they get assembled into the data that you want. So it's all to do with clients and servers. So a client is anything which is requesting information. Okay, so it could be a smartphone, it could be a laptop, could be this computer here and a client makes a request for a file and that's the technical term of request so the, the uh, your web browser says I'd like to request the HTML document for the university website it sends a request across the web server listens for these requests it reads the request and it sends the data back to the client but obviously the request from the client has to include who the client is, isn't it? So it knows where to send the data back to. So it's a very simple system and that's what makes it so powerful. The web browser, we have another name for a web browser. We don't call them web browsers, we call them user agents. Okay? A user agent is a device that can read web documents. So a browser is an example of a user agent. There's lots of different examples of user agents. Okay, so if you've got apps on your phone which receive data from the internet, like your Facebook app and your Twitter app, they're also user agents. So here's a nice little example to kind of put into context. <coughs> um, don't worry about lack of detail, by 3.05 you'll be experts at this. Okay, so what happens is there's my client, it sends a request to a unique URL on the server. So every page on the internet, every document on the internet has a unique address, doesn't it? The URL. And also it specifies a method. What do you want to do with it? The noun, the thing you're dealing with is the URL or the item at the end of the URL. The method is the verb. And most web browsers use get. Because get means just what it sounds like. Read, get a copy of. When you get more complicated stuff, you end up with post, put, and delete. And these correspond to the CRUD operators in databases. You're doing 220 this year, aren't you? Well, you'll understand CRUD operations. Create, retrieve, update, delete. There's four things you can do to data. Well, those get, post, put, and delete correspond to the four things you can do to data. So get is retrieve. Post is put, is uh, post is um, insert. Put is update, and delete is obviously delete. So you can now mirror what you do with a database with a website. So here we are. So I've asked to get the file called index.html from a host called www.coventry.ac.uk. That's my request. Can you see that? 
I've chopped a bit of the header out there to make it easier to, uh, to follow. And that arrives on the server. And the server says, oh, right, is that, does the document exist? If it doesn't exist, I'll send a message back saying doesn't exist, page not found. If it does exist, I'll bundle it up and post it back to the, as, a, as, a, as a response. And if you look at the response, it's got, it tells us what version of HTTP we're using, what the protocol is. So HTTP 1.1 is the latest version. 200 means it's good, it's okay. That's the status code. So 200 means okay. 300 means it's been redirected somewhere else. 400 means there's an error in the client's request. And 500 codes mean the server's got a problem. And there's hundreds of these response codes. And the idea is the browser receives the correct response code based on, uh, on the uh, result. What's really important about this is that last sentence on the screen. The whole process is stateless, which basically means that server has a goldfish memory. It has no idea who's, who's, who's sending, asking for the data. It simply responds to each request separately. It can't say, oh, that, that person just asked for a page a little while ago. It doesn't know anything about it. All it can do, it takes requests and responds with data. <coughs> when you go to websites where you log in and it knows who you are, that's because you've got a cookie, which is a file on your local computer. And that gets sent every time you make a request, so it knows which person it is. Without that, there's no state at all. And that's what makes it so fast. There you are. So 200, two XX codes, you know, 200, 201, 202, 203, 204, 297, you know, all the rest of them are success codes, three codes are redirections, four codes are client errors, and five codes are server errors. And within there, there's all sorts of interesting ones, like the IMT cup error. It was introduced in April the first one year. This slipped into the specification. So there's all sorts of stuff in there which you can uh, have a look at. Okay, so let's get on to a little bit more complicated stuff. <coughs> If you're browsing a static website, you simply request a file, the server sends a file back to your computer. End of story. However, after Christmas, we're gonna get a bit more complicated with this. Not after Christmas, sorry, after November. In December, we're gonna get more complicated. As a nice early Christmas present, we're going to be doing data-driven websites. And the idea there is, instead of sending, just sending back files from the server, what happens, is you make a request for a page and the server asks for data from the database to complete the page. Then that gets sent back to the web browser. So there's an extra layer in there. If you come across three-tier architecture, this is very much an example of three-tier architecture. All your data's on the database. The web server does all the button passing and to and fro to try and get the things organized. And then all the data gets sent to your computer. So that's say an example of a server side scripting setup. That's that's uh, dynamic websites. Okay, web servers. Everyone okay with that? You you good? Are you? Yeah. It's uh, it's a gentle introduction. We cover yes. Yeah, the two they can be two completely separate servers. Okay. So the database might be the same database that your company's using for its internal organization. So the web server talks to the database. Sometimes the database is on the same physical server as the, uh, as the web server. But as you'll find out in a minute, when I talk about a web server, I don't mean a server. Okay. There's two definitions of web server and it's very confusing. Okay, a web server is either the hardware that your stuff runs run on, yeah, as in a server, makes sense, doesn't it? But it also refers to the software that actually listens out for requests and sends data back. So your server might be running, might be a Linux web server. It might be running Windows or Linux or Mac or whatever it happens to be. It has to run a web server application before it becomes a web server. So the server, the, the, the uh, software we run on it, for example, Apache or... Uh, information in, uh, internet information uh, services that software is the it listens out for requests from clients without that software you've got a server you need a web server software to turn it into a web server 
and Apache is the most common web server. I think three quarters of web servers run Apache on Linux. And what all it does, it listens out for requests, and if it gets a request, it creates a little process, the process handles the request, and then the process dies. So it's all the called demons that get generated as, you, as, the, as the requests come in. And a good, powerful web server can handle millions of requests. It's a very, very powerful piece of software. So requests made by user agent, specifying the URL and method, and this web server sends a response back to the client. Request, response. Okay, that's the important bit. Right, here's the full request response pair. This is what you, will, what you would see if you dug around in the web browser. <clears throat> and there are plugins for Chrome and Firefox, which allow you to see this, to actually see what's going on. So the request specifies a method. And in this case, the method is get. It specifies the protocol, which is HTTP 1.1 and it specifies the target, where, where, the, where the page has got to come from. And the response, look what we get in the response. In the response, we know that the server's powered by ASP.NET, which means it's a Windows server. Um, content time is type is text HTML, so it's an HTML page. Um, content length, really important. Why is it important to know the content length in your header? What might happen? Why would you want to know the content length? Uh, you might lose some data. Yeah, yeah. If some packets missing, if you know how much data you're expecting to receive, and you measure how much data you've received, you, they should match. If it doesn't match, you've got to send the request again and get the data again. <coughs> Cache control. So, how is it stored? Is it cached on the computer? Um, content length, the date, <coughs> and so on. So, so really, there's all the information that the browser needs to understand the data that's coming back. <clears throat> okay, this is the most famous web server in the world. This started it all. This was the very, very first, first ever web server computer, 1990. And this, do you know where this was built? Which country? America. No, it wasn't America. It, no, it wasn't England. Russia. Switzerland. It was because there's a very famous research institute in Switzerland called Kern. You know the Haldron Collider? People that built the Haldron Collider? They also built the first web server. And the guy who built it is a guy called Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee, I should say. Tim Berners-Lee built the first web server and invented HTTP, uh, invented HTML, and he basically designed the whole system. And the server is just a desktop computer. It's a next step computer. And the sticker on it, if you look closely, says, this is a server, do not switch off. That was for the cleaners when they were cleaning the office. And that's, I believe, now is in the museum. That's, the, that's now an exhibit in the museum. So, moving on, and we got to, we're doing well. Let's have a look at URLs. Okay? It gets really excited at this point. Okay, we're looking at URLs. So how are web page URLs formed? So let's have a look at the bottom one, because the bottom one's the old-fashioned old style. It's every single character in there has a meaning. And once you understand the meaning, you can look at URLs and understand what's going on. The top one I'll leave for your own interest. The bottom one is the most important. So the first bit is the protocol, HTTP. Okay, that's our protocol we're using, so we start with HTTP. Colon slash slash, Tim Berners-Lee has formally apologised for, for enforcing that for forcing the whole world to type in colon slash slash. He said it was completely pointless, and it serves no purpose whatsoever. But it's too late to change it now. But he has issued a formal apology for that. Then we've got www. Now, www is actually the name of the server. You know, every server has a name inside the organisation. That www, there's a server somewhere called www in that organisation. It could be anything you want. Yeah, it could be ABC dot, whatever it is. That's just convenience, World Wide Web. Um, the example.com is your domain. So the domain is the address you've bought for your company. Makes sense? <clears throat> so example is the domain name for your company. So, so in our example, it's Coventry, isn't it? 
The bit afterwards, the com, is the top level domain. Com is a top level domain, .ac.uk is a top level domain, .co.uk is a top level domains, and they're handled by different organisations and different teams. So this is the example domain in the .com um, top level domain. So that's the basic, that's the sort of the, the main page. Then we go to five. That's the name of your file. It could be um, mycv.doc. You know, that's just the, that's the name of the file you've shoved on the folder, in the folder on that server. Anything you want. Then it gets a bit more interesting. After the question mark. Okay, you, anyone know what that data is? Now the description doesn't help you, so I can quite happily ask the question. That, after the question mark. The bit after the question mark, what is that? It's a request from a database. Almost. It's asked to request to a database. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's passing data across to the server. So in this example, my product ID is 1234. I'm going to sort by price and I want to print. So I can send the data back as values in the URL to the server to give it more information. <coughs> and you see that a lot. You know, if you do Google searches, you get a huge string, don't you, in the URL, in the address bar, with all the parameters. Ever try messing with it? Yeah. Changing it, seeing what happens. Best way to learn, play with it, see, see if you can break it. Chances are you probably can't. The great thing about putting the data in the address bar is you can bookmark it. If you think about it, if it's in the address bar, it's part of the bookmark, isn't it? Which means you can bookmark that exact page with that exact set of data in your in your favorites you can pass data in the head of in the header and the body but you can't then bookmark the page so if you want a page to be bookmarkable you need to put all your data in the url because that's the only bit that gets bookmarked okay use of the web use of the web are almost infinite now this is we're just uh, web surfing businesses job sites games file sharing you name it is out there but there are two sorts of there are two sorts of web. This year we're focusing on human readable web and we're going to dip our toes into machine readable web. All websites are designed for humans to read, aren't they? They've got colors and fonts and text and headings and paragraphs. That's called human readable web. We're going to cover something called uh, micro tags a bit later on when we start to insert some data which can be read by another computer. But next year, if you do 305, the whole year is all about machine readable web. Data that another computer can read and understand and translate and send to another computer. <clears throat> okay, we'll Evolution of web pages. Okay, static HTML pages, that's how it all started. There was no scripting, no, no databases, no programming languages. You had to manually build each web page by hand. And that's where we're going to start. Your first two assignments are going to be starting with first generation stuff here. We're going to design the website and statically build the website so you understand the technologies. Okay, then we're going to, in the, for the third and fourth assignment, we're going to move on to second gen. We're going to use scripting languages, databases, JavaScript, PHP to build dynamic web pages. For the last assignment, we're going to look at third gen. We're going to work with content management systems. So we're going to bring you up from the beginning up to speed. And in, the, in 305 CEDE, we spend the whole of the module on fourth gen. Yeah? So this is going to get you up to speed with the technology. We don't dive in head first. So first gen for the first two assignments, second gen for the next two assignments, third gen for the last assignment. Okay, just for your delectation, your first task is to, you've got to choose a theme for your website and then find existing websites which do the same thing or do similar things. But then you've got to go back in time and look at how those websites have evolved over the years. So what I've done, just to show you some examples, here's the uh, early 1990s. Okay, what do you notice about these websites? Yeah, there's no colour, apart from links. What else is strange about them? 
What's missing? Images. Yeah, there's no images. There's no images at all, are there? There's no colour, no images, because they were designed to transfer files from one university to another university. So we didn't worry about images and stuff, we just wanted the data, the text. Mid 1990s. And this really was a decade that Web forgot. That's the first ever Google website. Okay, so what do you notice now? We, we have some graphics. Um, we have a bit of colour, but these ones don't, don't really show it very well. They're pretty basic, aren't they? Low res, uh, there's no social media there, there's, you know, there's no nice graphical buttons and things. That's because in the 90s, the internet connection speeds were rubbish. If you had a big graphic in there, it would have taken you half a day to download the graphic. So this was designed for, to optimise the downloads. Early 2000s, that's the first ever YouTube page and the first ever Facebook page. The graphics are coming in, aren't they? The graphics are starting to arrive, they're starting to, uh, they're starting to the page is starting to get better layouts. But you've still got this horrible layout, you know, just plain white and black boxes, and it's, you know, there's no style to it at all. No social media. They are Facebook, 2004, that's the, uh, that's the first one. And that's why. One of the reasons for the rubbish web pages is look at the performance. That's bored is how many bits per second you can transmit. To transmit one character in an old system would take 8 bits or 16 bits. So effectively in 1965, if you were on a 16-bit system, which you wouldn't be obviously, you were transmitting one character per second. That's the, that was the top speed you could have. By the 1980s, you were sort of, uh, it was getting a bit faster, but it was still very, very slow, you know, number out of text. When the internet was around, that was the speed, 28k. That was the speed most people were surfing the internet in the 90s. It's kind of scary, isn't it? 28k, um, taking out drop packets and everything else. Um, so what's that? That's, that's, it would take you quite hours to download a high-res picture, wouldn't it? At least. 2005, there's a picture there, about US Robotics Sports to Flash modem. 56k. That was, that. That was the peak of uh, old technology. And that's why it took a long time for web pages to evolve. Until the, the internet connections went up in speed, you couldn't do much. You could have beautiful graphics in there, but people couldn't see them. I'll put this in for the uh, for, for a bit of light relief. The evolution of man and computer. <coughs> so um, the other problem was technology. And until, H until uh, HTML evolved, you couldn't actually have images. HTML1, there were no images. There was no image tag. HTML2, there was no image tag. Basic colours. HTML2, you couldn't even have colours. Sc the colour screens had 256 colours. In fact, you were limited to 213 colours in your web browser. That was it. Um, <coughs> to get things like social media, you had to have fast connections and you had to have lots of people using computers, ubiquitous computing. And the big explosion in website, in, in web development, has been social media. It's the big sort of catalyst for lots of change. And all a social networking is all about is a platform for social interactions. So rather than you going to a computer asking for information, you talk to other people through web pages. Um, it gets people with shared interests together. Um, uh, there's a subtle difference, by the way, between social networking and online communities. Online communities have been going for years. You know, the uh, online communities are people just sharing common interests and just contributing to the community. Social networking is person to person. It's very much on a personal level. Okay, issue with um, social networking. I'll bring this up now because I can't work out where else to put it in the materials. That's why it's in this slide. Who's got a YouTube account? Okay. okay, so you've got all these accounts and every account has a set of data in it. And you've got your friends in one system, they're not in another system. So you've got these silos of data dotted around and there's no interoperability between the silos. Because it's not in Facebook's interest to allow you to share the data with Twitter, is it? To import your, your contacts. So there's an initiative called FOAV, Friend of a Friend initiative. And what they're trying to do, they're trying to turn 
this data into machine readable data. So one service can read off another service. So you can, you can have one set of data, almost like a central login, and all the systems can read the same set of data. And for the latter half of this decade, this is going to be the big challenge facing the online systems. How you share data amongst different systems. Okay, I've had lots of talking to the MFA, but next week it'll be more demos. <coughs> Web standards. The only reason the internet works, and the only reason it's been successful, is because of web standards. If everyone's using different standards, you haven't got the internet, have you? You've got a series of small networks sharing the same cables. So the idea with web standards is they specify how things should work. So the, the web standard for HTML specifies how different tags should work on the screen, what they should do and how they should work, and what tags you should have. The important thing is non-proprietary, which means it's not owned by any organisation. As soon as an organisation owns something, they can make changes to it, which make it incompatible. And the great thing is, it allows lots of different devices from different manufacturers to talk together and to communicate. And it supports um, how you should do things and what technology you should use. And I mean, web standards is, should be almost a, a given now. Everyone uses it. If you start using proprietary technology, you, you eliminate a lot of your audience, aren't you? They can't use your, use your sites and your systems. And getting towards the end now, Web2, this is a big buzzword, Web2, been about the last 10 years, since about 2005. Unfortunately, with Web2, no one actually knows, knows what it means. There is no definition of Web2. The closest I've got is websites with cool stuff in. That's Web2. It's one of those terms which hasn't got a meaning, like, you know what Googleplex means? How big, how big is Googleplex? It's a number. It's one, and you keep writing zeros until you get bored. That's the definition of a Googleplex. So it, it, it depends. So websites are cool stuff. Ajax, you know when you're working on things like Google Docs, it's saving in the background all the time, isn't it? It's saving you stuff as you go along, and, the, the, um, and those, uh, the, chat, the chat areas, where it's constantly sending messages backwards and forwards without having to refresh the page. That's Ajax. And we'll cover that in the last session for this year to prepare you for next year. Social media, that's kind of cool stuff. So we'll call that, we'll stick that under the Web2 banner. Web apps, you know, websites that look like applications like uh, Google Docs is the classic one, isn't it? And uh, uh, Office 365, where it feels like a proper piece of software, but it's actually in the web browser. Interactivity, where you can do things, games and all sorts of stuff on the screen. Yeah, that's all, but that's cool. So we'll put that in Web2 as well. Lightweight. Okay, so it doesn't take forever to download stuff. You're not waiting for stuff to arrive all the time, are you? Yeah, it's, it's, it's instant. That's cool. We'll stick that in that box as well. Cross-platform. Does it work on smartphones? Does it adapt itself to smartphones? Does it work on desktops, tablets? Yeah, that's pretty cool. So we'll call that Web2 as well. And last one, is it standards compliant? Yeah, that's cool. We'll stick it in Web2. In other words, there's no definition of Web2. It's just the cool stuff which you might want to put in your website. So don't get hung up on the terminology. And last slide before we break, because I'm talking for far too long. Is it still recording? Okay. <coughs> web design trends. Where is web design going? Okay, you've seen where it's come from, haven't you? In those old picture those slides. Where is it going to? And what I've done, I've picked a few themes out of here from lots of different sites I've been trawling to look at Kind of, what's a cool 2013 website look like? What technology is in there? What's it doing? How does it, how's it work? The first thing is responsive layouts. If you look at it on your phone, it adapts to the phone screen, you know, with the nice big buttons and things and user-friendly. If you have it on a huge 30-inch monitor, it adapts to a 30-inch monitor. Because years ago, it was easy. 800 by 600, that was the size of your screen. You built your website that size. Nowadays, you've got so many different devices, haven't you, out there? From huge screens, phones, watches, yeah? You've got to have responsive layout. Next one is interesting. Your laptops, modern laptops, the newer ones have very dense pixels, don't they? Very high resolution screens. The web was not designed for high resolution screens. So the latest thing is you actually have two sets of graphics for your website and you detect, you sniff what screen they've got and you send the data through based on the, based on the screen they're using. 
so you can actually detect what sort of screen they've got and send the correct images through so you get this lovely crisp design large anyone seen large fixed backgrounds recently on, on the, this year on websites where they kind of fixed images behind and things scroll over the top that's in last sort of year or so that's that's quite new stuff so that's just to keep these in mind when you design your website um, translucency that seems to have made a bit of a comeback where you have translucent layers you might have a background then you have layers of stuff on built on top of it that's very 2013 I have to keep update this slide, this slide every year. Um, minimalist home pages. If you go to a place like, like uh, Dropbox, the home page, there's nothing there. There's a login box and a picture. It's the latest fashion to have almost nothing whatsoever on your home page. Get rid of all this clutter. And also tied in with that is feature tours, where you get to the home page and it's a little tour of how, how, how the thing works. And you've got, you know, next, next, next. And it kind of shows you how the site works. Enhanced social media integration, so full social media integration, you know, full integration with Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn or, or YouTube, you know, YouTube, you know, rather than just hear some comments from, from uh, Twitter. Um, anyone come across infinite scrolling? Who's on Twitter? As you scroll to the bottom, what happens? It pulls more content in, doesn't it? That's infinite scrolling. And that's done with Ajax. So it never ends. And I've seen infinite scroll sideways as well on some websites. Where it just it's constantly feeding data in as you scroll across. That's pretty cool stuff. And I'll try, if I get a chance, remind me and I'll try and show you how that's done. Uh, open source APIs. There's loads of frameworks now for building cool websites. And more and more companies are saying, well, rather than start from scratch, let's use these frameworks to build our websites. jQuery UI, uh, MooTools. There's dozens of them, hundreds of them. I think last time I checked on the JavaScript frameworks, there were a list of 200 frameworks. We're going to use jQuery with jQuery UI and next year jQuery Mobile because it's easy. And also, have you noticed the move away from Flash? Hasn't gone unnoticed then. More and more content, video content, animations in games are moving to, H to CSS and JavaScript and HTML, aren't they? There's less and less support for Flash. Anyone use the last, latest version of Adobe Flash? Okay, what are the export options now? From from the Flash software, from Flash CS5, what's the, you can export now as CSS. CSS. So even the Flash software can export as open standard CSS, HTML, and JavaScript. So that they're the big sort of web design trends. Now, <coughs> for your lab this week, I'm going to ask you demand of you to start working on your assignment straight away because you've only got four weeks to get this assignment done and the first week is looking at existing websites and there's a couple of things I'd like you to do for your, for your uh, lab the first thing is you've got to choose a theme for your year there's one limitation it has to be something to do with reviewing okay the reason for that is I want user data in there I want location data in there eventually you know, and I want some dynamic content coming taking place. So it could be, you know, it could be book reviews, it could be you know, lecture reviews, five stars obviously. It could be uh, um, cinema reviews, theatres, games, anything you want, as long as it's a review site. And then what I want you to do is find three websites which kind of attempt to review the same thing. So if I was, I mean, even I suppose even eBay could be considered a review site, couldn't it? Because you, you know, you've got these uh, the reviews in there. So, for example, if I chose um, games, uh, yes. No, you're working in groups. You can work on your own thing. You're working in groups to support each other, not to not not to to do the same project. Yeah, if you're working in groups in the labs, which is fine. The lab groups are support groups. They're not. You're not working on the same project. You're there. If you get stuck, you can very quickly grab your neighbour and say, "What? How? How does this work?" not for the assignments. <coughs> so if I was doing a game site, uh, I would look at maybe IGN as an example. Yeah, see these sort of sites? I want three. I want you to look at the features they've got so you can nick the ideas. And also I want you to use the Way Back When engine. Now you can't use it at the university because it's a proxy. And it's a big, no, no, you can't do proxies. So you have to do this bit at home. I'd like you to use the Way Back When engine and it takes you back to what the site used to look like in the past. And that's how I got those screen grabs. 
from Facebook and YouTube. So I want you to find the site which is at least 10 years old. So it's got to be at least 10. I want you to go back and look at the technology and the design and how it's changed over the years. I'm going to get a feel for how things have evolved. And the final thing I want you to do is to take a screen grab of the of one of the typical page or pages and I'd like you to think about how the page has been constructed and that's preparation for next week's lecture. So where's this a banner, is the navigation, is a footer and just even in Photoshop or even in Word just draw boxes over it and get a feel for how websites are constructed because they're basically just a series of boxes all joined together and if you bring that if you do that before next week's lecture we can have a really good discussion about this okay and make it much more interesting. So Welcome to 205. Um, who's already had the lab this week? Um, we had our hmm? Yeah, I've, I, have, I have killed him. You will never see him again. You realise this? Yeah? Bring a spade next time and I'll show you where, we did, where, he's, where, he's, where he's laying. <laughs> now, what I've done, right, the, who's in the group that got cancelled? What I've done for next week, he seems to have vanished off the face of the earth. I don't know what's happened to him. Um, I will be doing that lab myself. And I've got Tedja, who's a brilliant assistant. And we'll both, we'll, two of us will do that lab together to make up for lost time. Who went to the other lab? Guys, can I just listen, please? We haven't finished quite yet. Yes, everything you're doing is going to be marked. Yeah, dead easy. Right, qu final thing is there was a group which did meet this week. Now, you've, had, you've already had access to the server, haven't you? We have a creative server. We have a big Linux server, and every one in this room will have access to it. In your first lab, the first thing you will do is you will you'll be given the login for it and you will go in there and you'll connect to it and you'll change your password and you've got a database, you've got a secure shell connection, you've got FTP connection and you'll change your password and I'll show you how that works because then you've got somewhere you can start to put your website, right? Um, who has not had a lab at all this week and not had a lab that it's cancelled or otherwise? <coughs> your lab is tomorrow? No. There's one that was yesterday. I thought there was a third lab. Is there one later this week? Okay, maybe I'm just imagining this. It's probably 3.05. Actually, that's true because I think there's less of you. Last year, there were people sitting cross-legged on the floor this time of year. I think there's fewer of you, but obviously you make up in quality, don't you? What we lack in quantity. Okay, uh, final point is there is a feedback form on Moodle. I would like you to put your feedback it's just a simple multi-choice thing about how the lab went because I want to really closely monitor especially these sort of situations where things aren't working properly and every week just give me an honest feedback on, on how things went and there's I'm going to put a question and answer forum on each block so if you've got any questions after you've had a look at the materials you can ask questions on there and the staff can answer and try and give you answers and support